Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, so, as Doug has already alluded to, but I want to just make a couple of references to um, a couple of points. One is this is not the only thing that these companies or that Donors Choose does. This is just one thing of a larger portfolio that they have in philanthropy, cause related marketing, uh, corporate <laughs> social responsibility, whatever it is. But this is what they applied for. Um, having been a judge, it's truly stunning to see the stories and then to actually have to only pick one nonprofit and two corporations. One of the pillars is innovation. And what is happening now in philanthropy, it's much more common knowledge, crowd accelerated philanthropy and what you described. Go back to the starting and help us understand how you got this, how you got to this point. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the, the impetus was, was getting this awesome prize from, from Amazon and uh, wanting to let uh, uh, people all across the country allocate the award proceeds to classroom projects of their choice. We felt that if we used the proceeds in a top-down way, that would be kind of contrary to our model. What's happened since then is, is interesting. There's been something of a, a movement, I think, within corporate America to do uh, people's choice charity contests. And the, the assumption seems to be that these people's choice charity contests must be open-ended, totally open-ended, come one, come all. Uh, and examples range from uh, Pepsi Refresh to uh, the, the J.P. Morgan Chase Community Giving Challenge to uh, Kohl's um, uh, inviting people to vote as to which schools they want to support. Um, uh, Amazon, of course, was an example. American Express Members Project. And I think it's safe to say um, uh, uh, that in all of those cases, things didn't go exactly as the, as the corporate partner had planned. Um, in, in the case of Kohl's, for example, uh, I think they had images of like Norman Rockwell uh, schools, uh, that were public schools that were going to uh, win the, uh, the $10 million of, of prize money. And I think it was uh, something over 75% of the winning schools, which were, um, which were uh, born-again Christian schools or Hebrew schools uh, in, in uh, Brooklyn and Queens. And I, that was a, a great show of support by those schools uh, supporters, but probably wasn't exactly what the, the corporate partner had in mind. And so I think the pendulum is swinging back a little bit to um, crowdsourced philanthropy in a quality controlled environment. Uh, and uh, so and, and we'd like to play a role in that, but I'll, I'll stop there. So certainly you get the bottoms up, and then you go at it with um, corporate partners, Crate and Barrel being one of many. Um, can you talk about how you <coughs> develop that philosophy and then to have and to form a relationship with Crate and Barrel? Well, I think the, the hope with Crate and Barrel was that um, you get a whole different uh, uh, degree of, of of customer delight and uh, a whole different lift in even in purchase intent when you don't um, w w when you empower a consumer to go be a philanthropist. Uh, if the consumer is passive, if they're merely reading a press release or or reading a news story about a grant that was made sort of without their involvement, there's only a certain lift that one might get in terms of reputation uh, 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 for that company. And um, our thinking was that if we empower consumers to go be the philanthropists, uh, we could achieve just a whole different uh, relationship, both between DonorsChoose.org and those folks, and Crate and Barrel and those folks. And I think the, the, the single most exciting statistic from our perspective, Crate and Barrel got into this just because they wanted to do something good for the world. We wanted to show that a company could do well by doing good. And so the stat we were most excited about was when a test group of Crate and Barrel customers who were given this gift of giving proceeded to spend 16% more at Crate and Barrel stores than a control group of Crate and Barrel customers who shared all the same characteristics but who had not been given the gift of giving. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Jim, uh, going back to when this program started, Secure the Future in 1999, to where it's at today, you've talked about how it's informed some of your new programs. And when you ran the company, um, you talked about even at the board level, you were aware of this program. Yes, because of its size. Um, uh, I made sure that the senior management group, so maybe less than a dozen, but thereabouts, was actually the board of directors for the foundation. So this was not going to be CEO only. This is spanned now 
three CEOs. Our CEO would have been here, but his mother is celebrating her 90th birthday, and I gave him the day off to go over there. <laughs> so uh, it, it, the commitment has been there, and it grew from 100 to 160 million. There's still some seed money, but we're really at the stage of the funding of that program is probably mature and all this accumulated experience and know-how, which is so important, as I just said. So the pills are just one part. Uh, somewhere along the line, probably in the middle of that period, pediatric AIDS uh, became obvious to me. There was a whole generation of children that were not gonna survive unless we got involved there. That led to the building of six freestanding clinics, a partnership with Baylor University for new doctors who are willing to take a year out and forgive their loans and help them get on with their careers, and that's been a fabulous program. Um, and I'll come back to the lessons learned and what you've done with it as you've tried to scale it up over the years. Um, Lloyd, uh, 10,000 women, um, and the video and the testimonials, how did you make the business case um, for the program and the investment that you were thinking about making into it? Well, for us, um, look, there are a lot of things that we, uh, that we do that involves writing checks but we also wanted to involve the firm, and uh, frankly, we have an ideology also. You know, we're in business, we believe in markets. You know, we think that the initiatives of you know, something like the Gates Foundation have, have done and will do spectacular things for the world, but we also believe that something like Microsoft, the corporation, had important innovations, created wealth, alleviated poverty in certain places, made markets more efficient, lifted people out of poverty, that made a big contribution. We wanted to do something given what our core competence is that involved uh, markets and business and used some of the things that we had that we were better at than other people in the world. We had a very big convening power. So we had a lot of contact with business schools for business education. We're involved in the emerging markets. So we had access to people, uh, groups around the world with access to places where there was kind of a you know, proto-entrepreneurialism uh, that was um, that was uh, that was being generated. Um, we have the people to act as mentors. Uh, we obviously had the money to to drive it, but also in the firm, we also wanted to do things that had a human scale to it. We're a wholesale firm, so for us, being able to apply these lessons, being able to invest in people on a more human scale was very important. Of course, being Goldman, we measure things to death, we research things like crazy, and we were looking for our spot and our niche, and lo and behold, we had one of our important research per person who was just a real advocate for investing in women as a very highly leveraged way of generating high returns in this space, and also said this was a kind of place that was kind of, uh, that was kind of a little bit empty. So she wrote a piece called Womenomics, and wrote another piece called Women Hold Up Half the Sky, and a lot of statistics and a lot of metrics, and guess what, there the investment went. And so, um, you know, we're off and running. Did you read those reports? Oh, yes, yes, of course. And what was your reaction to them back then? I said, boy, this is a good place uh, to make an investment. My first reaction, of course, Stina Powell is here. Uh, my first reaction said, gee, $100 million for 10,000 women, how do we make it so we can do 100 million women with $10,000? <laughs> <laughs> But I said, but that, that's for the, um, that'll be for uh, 2.0 uh, as we try to scale these things. You can't get too far from who you are. But at the end of the day, uh, of course, we, everybody in the firm is very committed. How could you not be? So you talked about in your application and in your brief remarks here about the firm engagement and involvement. Sure. That this was not just about a check that you were going to be able to write and a philosophy that you had. What are some of the concrete examples of how the firm in your application over subscribed of people wanting to participate in Mentor? Gosh, we opened it up and we asked people for, so, you know, here are the elements of it. We get, we get sort of kind of conventional business schools to contribute resources and programmatic. We go out and also find platforms, business schools or things that are close to business schools in the relevant countries when we orchestrate programs and partnerships among them and then we create kind of certificate granting programs that are like mini M MBAs. We also, in some cases, help people get financing, and, and in almost every case, we provide mentors who are really Goldman Sachs people who deal on a very, very large scale, but who are dying to do things on a more human scale and apply what they know, you know, MBA types. Um, and so 
the, you know, the first bit of evidence, we knew we were onto something when we opened up and asked for people to volunteer as mentors, and we didn't have enough, we didn't have enough students, enough women to satisfy the demand of the mentors for people to help. And so we literally had a backlog of hundreds and hundreds of people in the firm, in some cases very, very senior um, um, investment bankers who some people would pay a lot of money to hire from time to time, <laughs> were just staying up at night and by email going over people's business plans, should I buy this? How long will it take me to recover the cost of this refrigerator or this motorcycle in connection with my business, given the incremental revenue that I think I would earn from that? And that kind of, you know, that kind of scale was very attractive to the people at Goldman Sachs. And um, one of the women in the video talked about benchmarking and strategy. Um, <laughs> is that the really type of uh, management training you're providing? Oh no, no, no. This was this is this is real stuff. You know, we had. Um, and we got a lot of help from partners uh, on this. Obviously, there are you know, schools that are very involved in entrepreneurial uh, type education, but we had definitely different, um, different units. So there'd be units on negotiation, units on accounting, units on um, you know, balance sheets, how to keep books, how to deal with, employ how to deal with employees, how to compute investment returns. Um, and including some analytics and benchmarking and the like. You know, this was a, in some cases, and it varies from place to place, but this was you know, months-long commitment. People worked very, very hard at this. They took homework. And I it to, by the way, some of the big, biggest benefits of this were the students dealing with students. You know, just like all of us network, these people sell to each other. And in, 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 in some of these uh, classes, I've been to some of these countries and watched these, uh, these classes. So yes, they do, uh, they, they, there's a little, you can't get away from the jargon all the time, but I think they, would fa they found this uh, you know, very, very substantial. And then we measure the consequences of the lessons. So you believe in markets and you believe in your people. Did you ever think that this wouldn't actually accomplish the measurable results that's a pillar of the awards process? In all honesty, um, I didn't think it would become as um, it would become as big and as important as it became. I mean, obviously, it had to get over a threshold, but you invest in things, you have ideas, and you have hopes. Um, and I think only time and experience and the measurement and the metrics confirm whether you're right or wrong. At this point, I'd say the jury is not really out. I mean, things can go in different directions, but at the point at which People are hiring and recruiting, and there's more new generations coming. And by the way, the infrastructure that we put in place, the courses, the teachers that are trained by some of our partners, these, these are going to go on, go on forever. And the enthusiasm that you see is sort of confirmation that you know, certainly accomplished our objective of people thinking that going out and creating business and generating wealth um, is, you know, is important for their communities. Jim, did you ever think in your management team, either at the board level or <clears> running <throat> it, that you weren't going to achieve the desired results? Well, much like Lloyd described, you can imagine a pharmaceutical company measures everything also. So outcomes research is really what the company is about. Uh, that same approach was used to this. So I remember sitting, looking at data, and, and obviously you can measure viral load. And if the people are getting the medicine, they're getting the clean water, they're learning uh, how to get food and nutrients, uh, you can measure that. So uh, everything I ever saw was that the outcomes are getting better and better over time. Uh, our dilemma was that there would be a day when the 150, 160 million dollars was gone. Uh, and you know, what are we going to do next? And around 2008, seven, maybe in that time frame, the whole idea of uh, let's take the faculty, the people that we've trained in these places, that the young doctors have helped train, and see if we pull back a bit on the grant making, but continue to support the community involvement, how would that go? And I think that's going very well. So our mark uh, in Africa is going to be there for a long, long time. And Charles, from the nonprofit's perspective, uh, one of the pillars and hallmarks of CECP is the executive leadership, um, CEO and board. Um, do you have any evidence that um, with CEO and C-suite involvement versus without it, um, partners are bigger, sustainable, or anecdotally or anything on that? Oh, I, it was huge for us that the leadership of, of Crate and Barrel, both, both five years ago and now, uh, were either married to teachers or were teachers before. Um, th that, that was... Um, that was that was absolutely critical and absolutely did lead to a much longer lasting And do you see that across other partnerships? 
certainly when 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 a, a C level executive is is bought in, that that sure helps. Um, so yeah, I think uh, short answer would be yes. Yep. And you said five years. Can you talk about duration uh, relative to scale and quality? Absolutely. Um, well, one thing we notice is that when we've forged a partnership of, of a certain duration, th there's a real brand association between DonorsChoose.org and, and that company. And, and um, it actually makes sometimes uh, uh, supporting DonorsChoose.org less attractive to that company's competitors. Uh, and, and that's one reason why uh, a multi-year partnership is, uh, is critical. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, I'm just curious. Uh, um, two things. One is having met um, the team that actually has been running this on a day-to-day -day basis and seeing their personal point of pride that they take in this program is really actually a little bit um, stunning. And uh, I can imagine that company-wide, it really should be applauded and, and, and commended. Well, it is. I think uh, much like Lloyd's company, we get uh, tarred with feather because we make profits. Um, Profits sort of make the world go round. However, some of those profits have to be given back. Uh, obviously, Secure the Future in 1999 was a piece of that. Uh, we're taking all that learning. Uh, I guess I'm the guy that helped target now. I said, what about the US? What, what are the issues in the United States? And the issues here are 24 million Americans have diabetes, uh, type 2 and it's projected to grow to 44 million. So that's close, as close as you can get to a pandemic here in the United States. So where we just started with another 100 million bucks and all that accumulated learning to look at things here in good old US of A. So we're gonna try it again. We'll, we'll put, the, put the measurement together and see what happens. Yeah, so, so you've actually kind of uh, taken the thunder from my next question, which is, if you were to design this program from scratch again, what would you do differently about it today? And obviously, I could only assume you're incorporating that into your new program. Yeah, not, not every partnership, you can uh, picture Africa, not every partnership was a roaring success. Depends an awful lot on the personalities, the willingness to get involved. Um, but that's hindsight. So I think we try and take the accumulated knowledge we have um, we're trying in Central and Eastern Europe some things on cancer. Uh, in China, hepatitis B and C is the scourge. So all the areas where we've got some technical expertise, because that's an area that we're focused on, uh, we're trying to duplicate what we did in Africa. And that's where we're at today. And it was a skill transfer program. It wasn't necessarily a grant program. Can you say a little bit more on that? Well, I think, uh, as I said, if, if uh, you can have the medicine, but if you don't have the community support, uh, you don't have the learning of, you know, you have to take your medicine at certain times, you have to eat certain foods, you've got to have clean water to make this go. Um, I think we're at a stage now that we've done this in enough places, we've shown the outcomes data that people believe us, and then it's a matter of getting that local community involved. As I said, not everyone is at the same degree of excellence uh, that we would like, but significantly moved in that direction. And we have at least 50 of these faculty members <coughs> who probably know as much about it as we do at this stage, and they're, they're prepared to do it for their lifetimes. Yeah. Uh, Lloyd, on executive leadership, beside yourself, uh, and Jim talked about uh, as a board member, um, how is your executive team involved in this, um, and what's their role and responsibility, both from a fiduciary oversight perspective, but also um, can they get, engage in it as well? Oh, sure. This is very, it's very scalable. There's a lot of enthusiasm. We also do this around the world. So we have, um, you know, we have people in London who, you know, are committed, you know, who kind of take the Africa beat. They go down in there. We have a, an office in Johannesburg. Um, we have business in, in South America. Now, the places where the money market, the, the market centers and the industrial centers where we, ne we do our core business aren't always the same places uh, where we make the biggest contribution by sponsoring this education. But the people in local areas who have enthusiasm and pride for their, their own countries uh, think they're contributing to the nation building. They are contributing to the nation building of their own country by sponsoring uh, these things in their own country. Take China. We may be, you know, our business as a firm is in, um, is in uh, Beijing and Shanghai, 
uh, but a lot of the investment in, uh, in, in investment in this kind of education would happen, you know, more in the West. But we involve a lot of our people around the world, and people, um, you know, people, you know, people like this stuff. Again, it's a bit of a, a, an ideology, and across, you know, Jim certainly. I mean, he's in the, you know, from where we sit, there's a lot of things that need to be done, and you can, you know, you can write a check and make a grant to anything, and there's so many fabulous um, causes, and we do a lot of that. But you kind of take pride in what you do. If you're in the pharmaceutical business and you, you cure diseases and you distribute those cures and you teach people how to use it and you save lives, you know you couldn't kill. You, know, you don't kill yourself for your work unless you thought you were really accomplishing something. And if you believe that, that's what you want to. That's what you want to go out and extend and convince other people, reassure other people the value of that. And so as Jim's company does that in his business and he looks around for more things to fix for people and to extend lives and to improve lives, we're doing that same thing. We're trying, we look and find you know, places where there's poverty and where there's not enough education. We say, gosh, what can we, how can we invest in this in a way that will leave the infrastructure behind for the kind of education that will allow people to transact with each other, create, innovate, and earn. And to this point about profits, when something is profitable, I'm reassured that it's, that it's sustainable. It, you know, not, and let me tell you, we've done a lot for non, nonprofits, but every year, you know, nonprofits have to worry about whether their grant is going to be renewed. But if I could tell you, if in the middle of a community, somebody is sponsoring a, uh, you know, a school of, uh, uh, you, know, for, you know, for people who do hair or clean water tanks and arrange flowers or a catering service and makes money, gosh, I, could, well, I know that's going to sustain. That's what profits are. Profits means it's sustainable. Um, and your firm, having been on the executive floor of your offices uh, and actually being in a meeting with one of your executive team members, um, trying to convince them that play was more important than 10,000 women, um, uh, um, he 10, said- 10,000 plays. 10,000 really. 10, 10, right, 10, playgrounds. playgrounds yes. so. By the way, nobody's asked me for marketing help recently, so I can give it to you for free. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what impressed me in having been in other C-suite offices across the country, the embedded um, values on your executive team relative to being able to not just speak to this program, but actually be able to talk to um, every single woman that they've been able to meet along the way was a differentiator for me. And, um, um, does that come top down, bottoms up? I mean, does that come from you? Um, are you are you mandating it? No. Let me say one thing is the thing sometimes speaks for itself. So, for example, I could have gone. You know, one of the other surprises: the people that we engage with in these places are terrific. I mean, there's nothing remedial about it other than the fact that there's not an opportunity. But when I when you see some of these, I mean. We didn't, we didn't do it today. Sometimes we've been fortunate enough and had some people come in and make presentations. I'm sure some of the people here have heard some of these. I'm thinking to myself, here I go up on there and I'm reading my little paragraph, and gee, I hope I say every word right. These people come up, sometimes 24 years old, 25 years old. They've gone through civil war, they've lost their parents, they took care of their brothers, and then they go into, in a passionate way, what their business is like, and I'm telling you, so smart, and so good and so infectious in the, you know, this is infectious in a good sense, infectious in their enthusiasm, <laughs> um, that um, this is an infection you don't want to kill. Um, you, it catches us all up. And so I haven't had a problem prodding people into getting engaged. It's, the ability to deal with this has been a scarce commodity that I've been able to allocate like a prize. Mm -hmm. have, you been, have you seen the same um, results with the 10,000 small businesses? Um, it's newer. The answer is, the answer is yes. But we're doing it's a prototype. One of the things, and you know, we have you know my partner and co-chair that is Warren Buffett. He said, "This is fantastic. Just don't make a mistake and don't get anything wrong. Make sure it works from the get-go." So, in our enthusiasm, anticipating a question that you'd already asked, what would you do differently? I'd say, "Gosh, given you know, we have something like a 10% or so acceptance rate for 10,000 women." So you, the thought was. We'd like to scale it. And in 10,000 small business, it's similar. Instead of using 
you know, the American school in Afghanistan as the local partner. We're using community colleges. So in New York, it's LaGuardia College in, in Queens. Same kind of thing, a kind of a certificate, abbreviated MBA program, uh, financing. Uh, if, the, if the idea is good enough and it passes muster, we have uh, financing partners, including you know, using our own money, mentorship, you know, good program, and then launch it out. But in that, you know, but the important thing was to make sure it worked. And so we did it as prototypes. So we had our second graduation in LaGuardia College, uh, uh, Junior College last week. We have our first graduation in New Orleans next week. We do this in Houston, and we have a program that's about to graduate in um, LA and Long Beach, California, and then we will scale it up. But the big thing we thought was, gosh, we could make this much bigger, much quicker, but we're, we're holding ourselves back to make sure that we test it and that people are, what do we test? When you come out of this, what do people do? Do they hire more people? Does it develop the confidence for them to go out and make an investment? Um, do they make more money? Do they make more revenue? What do they do when they make more revenue? Are they reinvesting it in their business? And so we started this a year ago. We probably put hundreds, not thousands, through it. But the idea is once we confirm that these things work, then we scale it up quick. Interesting. Um, Jim, uh, you're very passionate about this. What have you learned from your involvement uh, in the, the efforts and the initiative personally? Well, I, I guess. Um does go a little bit to the company's culture. So you can picture an awful lot of our people coming to work there with the idea that they're not necessarily going to win the Nobel Prize, but they're going to make a contribution to cancer or to hepatitis or HIV AIDS. So th this has really been a rallying cry. And as I said earlier, now we're going to try it in some other therapeutic classes where the needs in various parts of the world are very similar. And here we sit with uh, money and talented people who also volunteer. So we, we get our people to, they want a three month internship and do this, uh, very passionate. So I, I think people sometimes think businesses are full of profiteering kind of people that don't care about their fellow citizens. I think most Americans uh, like to get involved in these kind of things. So for us, it's been a great rallying cry. Mm -hmm. and, and um, professionally, have you learned any new skills? Have you, um, have you gone outside what your own comfort zone is uh, in pursuing the, the program's goals? And Yes. So I, I learn every day I go to every board meeting that I'm in. I learn something new. I think this program, while I said I was familiar with it as an independent board member, um, seeing the statistics, seeing the involvement of the company, um, said to me, this is a good thing. If it's scalable and repeatable, let's do it. And in 2009 or 10, when we said, we're going to have some diabetes drugs, how is diabetes going in the United States? It's, it's a silent disease. It ends up, you know, you go blind. Uh, you have loss of limb. It's a pretty terrible disease. So if not diagnosed and caught early, uh, there's a huge societal cost. So. Uh, I picked up on that and I didn't really push uh, all that hard on the hundred million and next thing I know the foundation's fully funded and the program's underway. So, well, so do I learn as I go? Absolutely. Um, and so it wasn't just charity, it was change. It was really life changing. Yes. Um, one of the common themes, interestingly, just sitting here in an observation is bearing witness is that Charles and what you're doing um, with your partners is allowing an individual to make a choice and then to follow that choice through on what may be both the output and the outcome if they want to follow it that way. Um, same you know, with the Secure the Future, same with 10,000 Women. Uh, is there any lessons as a model that should be learned out of that for any other corporation or CEO or board of director out there contemplating um, how do I use the right lever um, towards a myriad of problems out there? I, well, I think, I think one lesson is that um, it's a false choice between um, uh, giving your consumers uh, creative expression and the liberty to pick the causes that are most dear to them, the projects that mean the most to them, between that 
and the quality and integrity that comes from a classic uh, uh, grant. I think people felt like they had to choose between the two, and, and I think that's a false choice. You can allow for uh, freedom of expression and, and creative liberty on the part of Crate and Barrel customers who could, who could express really personal areas of passion and still find classroom projects that matched. I think that was one uh, lesson learned. And yet, uh, we, we struggle, this is sort of like on a geeky tactical note, but we struggle with uh, the balance between giving people too much choice uh, and, and letting them uh, get through our website quickly. For many of our donors and website visitors, uh, we have to obscure the fact that there are 25,000 classroom projects on the site at any time, because just knowing that is intimidating and off-putting, and, and we lose a website visitor. Uh, and so it matters a lot, the, the algorithm that we use to bubble up classroom projects matching certain criteria around poverty and the teacher having never been funded before, and other donors having piled on to that project, suggesting that it's a really compelling project. But we've, we, we struggle still, and we know we've not cracked the nut on um, simplicity and speed and, uh, uh, and, and choice and, and the, the, the ability for, for a consumer to express so choice. If somebody gets funded, how much do they, I mean, if somebody puts something up, let's say one of the, you know, obviously you have thousands, some people get nothing, but you know, say like the, in, a, in a top 5% mm -hmm. from the top, how much money would they get for a project because they're on the website? Average project on our site is $500, and the success rate of the projects on our site is about 63%, oh, which really? is halfway between the, the likelihood that something you put up for sale on eBay will actually be sold and the uh, completion rate of microloans on Kiva. Uh, so we're sort of right in between in terms of uh, liquidity of the marketplace and, and uh, balance between supply and demand such that it's uh, two-thirds of, of the classroom projects put on our site that get fully funded, even if they're showing up at the, at the bottom of those 25,000. You said earlier that you actually have some ideas for other people. What are those ideas? What are the ABCs, one, two, threes that from crowd, uh, uh, crowd philanthropy, crowd accelerated philanthropy that you may want to offer up? Oh, I, I think it's just to think hard about um, uh, pieces of your value proposition that your uh, users or beneficiaries might be willing to shoulder themselves. Uh, in our case, the, the big example of that was two years ago and before paying uh, college students to review and vet and authenticate each project request before posting it, and then realizing that in the same way that Tom Sawyer convinced his friends that whitewashing his fence was this great privilege for which they should be very grateful, we could actually turn to our best teacher users, uh, and who more expert than a teacher who's been successful getting projects funded on our site, turn to them and ask them to shoulder the labor of uh, vetting and, and reviewing each project. We think of it as uh, academic peer review meets Wikipedia. And, and I think there's, there's a, a, a parallel for that uh, in, in most businesses as, as, uh, and, uh, and nonprofits, okay. where stuff you think just has to be done by staff could instead uh, be, be crowdsourced to, to, uh, to the general public or even to your beneficiaries. So so could people, can, can you say quick? Could people give this out, like companies give this out, like, like airlines give out air miles, so that instead of giving out, instead of giving I see out a business idea germinating here. <laughs> No, is that, I mean, that's, that's kind of like it, too. Instead of asking people to give a contribution at the end, companies can, like, affinity, it could be an affinity, like an affinity program for an airline. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Charles with a big smile. <laughs> we don't deal with people. We deal with institutions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Deputy Undersecretary uh, Tony Miller at lunch um, spoke and he talked about the educational reform that's going on um, and he was very clear about in the horizon of four or eight year cycles in terms of education, you have to manage to inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Um, um, do you think about, do you, all of you, do you think about your projects in the same way that over the you know, span of change, a generation, um, what may be some of the inputs, outputs towards the longer term outcomes we're all trying to achieve? It starts with uh, collecting the statistics and uh, studying them, uh, presenting them to management, you know, then making an informed decision. Is it doing what it was intended to do? It's no different than everything else we do in business. So, I mean, we, we've already got the habits formed. It's just using that very same approach on the foundation not-for-profit side. I think, uh, you know, by your attendance here today, and uh, I'm sure the, you can have the videos, somehow this word needs to get out uh, among other corporations. Uh, you know, we wish there were 300 winners here today. There's three of us. So, um, 
this isn't automatic in every boardroom in the United States. So uh, I think we all have some education to do where giving back fits in. And as Lloyd said, you can't, you know, there's not enough money to go around for everything that needs to be done. You've got to target someplace. And again, to, to my predecessor, somebody targeted Africa, but we we're finding that it could apply to other geographies yeah. as well. One of our partners is Bridgespan. They're pretty tough counters. Uh, and uh, they, you know, so we bring in outsiders so that we not, uh, you know, we don't fall too much in love with our own stuff. We want to make sure that there's some external confirmation of, uh, of, of what we think. I think that's, an, that's important. We do that in the same thing when we evaluate our trading and positions. We make sure that the traders aren't doing it themselves. We take other people and have them do it. And we make sure that the people who are, um, you know, getting the statistics and saying that there's real growth here and real job creation are outsiders who have no, um, no uh, nexus to the, pot, you know, to, to the success of the uh, mm -hmm. sex of this, maybe even adversarial to some extent uh, in being uh, tough uh, taskmasters. Um, now, I think in all these things, there are other bottom lines, too, because Jim was alluding before, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you do this project, you spend the money, and you, but you're leaving behind a whole infrastructure of healthcare professionals that know how to do stuff, and they'll do it forever, That's and they'll train other people. So I'm thinking in, in the things that we're doing, we're very conscious that when we give money, we're giving money to educational institutions in these places, which are woefully short of, uh, of, you know, you know, of, those, you know, of those commitments. And so you know, we're trying to leave behind educational infrastructure behind. We're investing in women, which we think is quite important. We're investing in these emerging economies. And so there's a number of different things that, even away from the big result of whether we actually you know, create a business that then goes out and hires 200 people who then go out and feed, you know, send their kids to school that they otherwise wouldn't have done and buy medicine they otherwise wouldn't have had. We're also thinking, gosh, that school looks a lot different now for the, you know, for the $200,000 we, we've given it to do these programs and for the, for, the, for the educators we've trained. So there's a number of, you know, there's a, there's a multiplier effect to this, I think. And I want to talk about the multiplier effect in a moment, but you talked about bringing in um, Bridgespan, uh, but it, I think it also said that your internal global markets insights group is very keen on monitoring, tracking the future trends of um, where some of the marketing, not, not marketing, but the markets demand for what they may need. Is this also a way to engage the employees in the skill-based volunteering? As a matter of, again, you know, I find the parallels in what Jim is talking about. As a matter of culture, yes, but we don't think we're performing our business in the places where we're investing in 10,000 women, just like Jim's company's not selling these vaccines and these things in those countries. But the culture of the company is in that direction, and so it's a good fit. And also, in all businesses, and you know, again, people want to feel good about what they do and who they are. And I, you know, I tell you, if my kid went to the, you know, went to the Ford Foundation, I'd feel spectacular. And I want to feel spectacular if my kid went to Ford Motor Company, too. Because I think both of those things are essential for the world and do good for the world. And I want people to think that way. In other words, if I had a secret point here, it's that I'm not comparing one to the other. One has to be better. They're both terrific. If you are giving over your lives, as many people in this room do, to the not-for-profit sector, that's fantastic. But if you're in an industry that's going out and employing people and raising people out of profit, making things more efficient and creating wealth and that gets distributed in a fair way, you're also doing great things for the world. And so those are all, you know, that's all part of the ideology and the structure here. Uh, multiplier effects. Uh, all of you have said it. What does it mean to you? And how do you know when you've achieved it? Well, one example of a multiplier effect is, is one of the Crate and Barrel customers who got a $25 gift of giving was uh, Maxine Clark, the founder and CEO of Build-A-Bear Workshop. She got that $25 gift card, found a St. Louis classroom project. I think it was for a field trip to a local museum. She fell in love with the project. She fell in love with our organization. And, and uh, the result is uh, uh, significantly bigger than $25. Um, and actually, th there are a few uh, venture capitalists in, in Silicon Valley, one being a uh, Vinod Kosla, who gives donors choose to order gift cards to friends and then runs an ROI calculation a year later looking at the total dollars added by the redeemers 
uh, and, and in one instance he was able to get a 60x uh, ROI within 12 months uh, because a handful of the people to whom he had given gift cards truly got hooked. hard time. Who's hooked. running Goldman Sachs yeah. and who's running <laughs> Donors Choose? Let here. me give you a suggestion. Give out cards with bigger denominations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 if you're going to go to Silicon Valley and give out cards. <laughs> Jim, any comments on multiplier? Well, I think everybody in the room understands multiplier. It's 1 plus 1 equals 8, 10, 12, 15, whatever. Uh, and as I said, we're at a stage now where less money and more multiplying. And the fact that we have 50 <coughs> faculty members who are willing to go teach other communities, what they've learned and how they've seen the success there and how important it is to be patient-centric. So think of the whole patient. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if this organization and we're all here 10 years from now, hopefully we'll look back and say, you know, that there became 100 faculty, uh, has a wider distribution than the 20 countries. So, so at some point, Lloyd and I look back at our legacy and we'll be old guys and say, you know, we had a part of that. So th this is an important part of giving back. It's not the for-profit side, but I've always felt somewhere on my personal scorecard somewhere was take some time to give back. And make sure Bristol Myers keeps us alive for the 10 years. And in the meantime, I hope that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on all Good, 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 good. Thank you. I, I, forgot, I forgot to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Um, when you think into the future on your programs, um, do you have any hopes, desires, aspirations um, for what's next um, based on winning this award, the additional recognition that you're getting, but what's the potential um, that still is unmet out there and how are you going to go out there and fill it? Well, for us, it's, it's framing someone's donate, financial donation to a classroom project on our site, not as an end unto itself, but as a first step on a path that's going to lead to uh, profound engagement with public school classrooms on the other side of the tracks. Uh, and so one example of this is a few weeks ago, we opened up all our data. Uh, and that uh, refers to the information uh, attached to 300,000 classroom projects posted by 180,000 teachers at 43,000 public schools. And the data is everything from uh, is the teacher a Teach for America core member to uh, whether 50% or more of the student population comes from military families, the poverty rate of the school, the latitude, longitude, the essay that the teacher has written, which can be mined for recurring themes like autism or school bullying or Shakespeare. Uh, and now uh, de developers and data crunchers, hundreds of them right now, are mashing up that data, uh, making discoveries about what teachers really need, what pieces of technology are actually effective as expressed by what the best teachers on the front lines are requesting on our site. Which novels are high school teachers in high poverty communities uh, requesting most often as an expression of which books people on the front lines think are the most effective at getting kids hooked on reading. And that's actually an example of a non-financial form of engagement with public school classrooms on the other side of the tracks. And we hope that there'll uh, be more and that um, we'll be able to, to look at conversion, not just of website visitors into donors, not just in terms of cr customers who agreed to redeem a gift card, but conversion of donors into fully engaged uh, uh, education activists. Jim, last words on hopes for the future for yeah, secure I, the future and tap. Yeah, so it, well, it's trademarked. Uh, I believe secure the future fits every one of us uh, here in the room. Um, again, I, I just think we have wonderful learning there. We have limited resources. Um, your conference here today and tomorrow. You're going to network and learn. We talked about innovation. I guess all those principles apply. And as I said, when we're old and uh, forgetful and, and we look back to say, you know, this was something really good that, that left, it was left behind and has continued to thrive. So that, that's my approach. Great. Lloyd, last thoughts or comments? You know, it's a wide open, it's a, you know, just listening, um, you know, just listening to Charles, I'm thinking, gosh, this is, you know, which is really, it really sounds great to me, and it's very interesting. I'm thinking, gosh, do you just give money? Do you give stuff? Other than, you know, there's just so much. I mean, the world is opening up where the leverage you get from the technology and from the participation and the culture is changing. In other words, people, you know, generation or two generations 
younger than us just approach this so differently. I just think that the, the chance to do things in a much more leveraged way and reach more people and make things more efficient and targeted are just so, uh, you know, so great. I just, um, you know, I'm just very, very optimistic uh, for the future. Yeah, so I hope that uh, you see what the awards selection committee saw, that the organization CEC piece um, saw, but also that you're able to take some of these kernels that comes out of this and sell it both up to the C-suite and board levels at your organizations, but fundamentally for yourself to think about um, what is the differentiator um, from good programs to truly great and sustainable programs. So will you please join me in thanking, congratulating, and commending uh, the three award winners uh, here today. And then I think Doug's gonna come back up and close us out. Good job. Congratulations. Good job to you. Thank you.